In this world we've created, our hero begins their journey. Along the way, they meet a varied cast of characters that both help and hinder them. Who is this cast of characters, and what are their broader meanings? Let's do our ancestors proud and talk about classic archetypes. I'm author DC Ferguson, and this is the World Building Dojo. Now, before we get started, I want to give you all a quick reminder. Subscribers to my newsletter are getting a copy of Cora Blake, Arcane Agent, for free. This short story is a prequel to the Dragon's Dream Saga and is a great chance to get started with the series. I link the newsletter sign up in the comments. Make sure to sign up and get your free copy. So, why archetypes? What are they and how do they work? What are all these rules, man? Alright, alright, calm down. Archetypes can be easily boiled down to the category of the character they fall into. We're going to go over eight types, but some characters that we point to, as you'll see, can be two archetypes in one. You don't even need to use all eight archetypes either, but I'd also say do so at your own peril. Archetypes can also be inanimate objects, except for the hero, obviously. No one wants to watch two hours of the most heroic toaster on the planet sitting on a counter. Now. Every journey begins with a protagonist. Whether you're creating a single hero or a team like we've been talking in our previous videos, our protagonist is the central figure or figures at the heart of the narrative. Everything that takes place or goes on around them is because of them. The concept of the hero archetype has a very basic definition. This is the archetype that walks the hero's journey, a tale of rising and falling action, of loss, renewal, and transformation. The hero walks into the start of our story as less than their true potential, and by the climax they have reached the top of the mountain to overcome their nemesis, the shadow. While the path that the hero takes is not always the same for every character on every world, the nuts and bolts aren't what we're looking at here. When we're assessing archetypes, we're looking macro, we're looking at the bigger, more general picture. For example, I mentioned in a previous video that I disliked Neo's turn toward a messiah figure in the Matrix Revolutions, and a big part of that is that Neo in the first Matrix film, like Luke Skywalker, has a lot more in common with King Arthur than Jesus Christ. These stories are as old as time, and we're constantly retelling them, tales of a hero that rises up and overcomes. Neo is just another example in a long line of people gathering around a fire and weaving the same story beats. Psychologist Carl Jung got way deeper into this, actually studying our hero's journey and mining it for deeper meaning. These tales, he believed, endure because it is a recounting of the triumph of the conscious mind over the unconscious mind. For example, perseverance despite, let's say, a fear of snakes. Basically. We tell these tales and we love these tales because they're an instruction set for our brains. Call it inspiration or hero worship, but at the end of the day, our brains are big, squishy computers, and hero tales are an instruction set to overcome adversity and grow. Now, that got a little heavy for sure, but I think most of us understand what the hero is, so let's move on to the other archetypes you may not be so familiar with. Whether you're referring to Obi-Wan, Morpheus, Dumbledore, or good old Merlin, the hero's journey is often impacted and guided by a mentor figure. On its surface, you might think to yourself, oh, I get it, and we can just move on to the next one. But we're digging deep here to really understand what these archetypes are and why they exist. What is the concept of the mentor, and how does it inform our storytelling? The mentor is an aging mirror. They're a reflection of the past, of someone that walked a journey of their own. It is their responsibility as the elder to pass down their wisdom when they see this young member of a new generation about to walk a path. Like a parent, their instinct is to guide them, to avoid the mistakes of the mentor's past, to be better than they were. Whoa, I know, right? The implications for this mentor figure in your storytelling all of a sudden has a lot more gravity and meaning to it. It's a passing of a torch, the memory of our ancestors urging us on to be better than they were. In storytelling, the mentor figure often dies, the final lesson for our hero. This is the death of an age, the generation before our hero sacrificing themselves to forge a better future for their children. Their sacrifice is martyrdom, ensuring that the ideals they've instilled in the hero never leave them. 
if you think of this in tribal terms, when we were all villages and small communities gathered around the fire at night, this figure is our elder, our shaman, even our father. When we look at it from this perspective, all of a sudden the mentor role has so much more gravity going on, and that's good, it's supposed to. Now, what we're supposed to look at in a different way is that Gandalf and Obi-Wan, they're so much more important, and they should be treated with great reverence. So, if the mentor is above us, then who's at our right hand? The ally is the person at the hero's side. They can be a rival at first, or their best friend, but when the journey begins, the ally is the hero's most trusted companion. They are there to remind them of the mentor's words, or to use their specialty to aid the hero, or to just provide a distraction, or a shoulder to cry on. The ally is our community. They're representative of our entire tribe, and our best friend. You hear the term now of, you know, our ride or die, and that's the ally. They'll follow the hero as far as they can go, even to the very end. They too can pay the cost of their life to spur the hero on because they believe in the hero, and the hero represents the good that they bring to the whole of the community. In this regard, it doesn't matter if they're not as strong as the hero. As far as the hero is concerned, they're equals. It's important to understand that the ally believes in this new age. The new age is the world that comes after the heroes completed their journey. To them, the hero is a herald of this new age. Now, speaking of heralds... This is where we start getting a little weird, because the herald often isn't a character. The herald is the message that, well, heralds the start of change. Whether it's an event, like a meteor being detected heading for Earth, or R2-D2 spitting out Leia's cry for help, the herald says the world isn't right and now it's time to change. Star Wars definitely played with the formula by making R2-D2 an ally as well as the herald, but that shows you the flexibility of this archetype, and also how to play with archetypes in general. While Luke may be the protagonist, there's a very good case to be made that R2-D2 is actually the hero of the story, though he undergoes no transformation, and that pretty much disqualifies him. With the Herald, we again liken this to our ancestry, as oracles speak of a quest or a journey to grow our tribes or expand our territory. The nearby eruption of a volcano means our people must move south through perilous lands. Someone must lead them. A scout reports that a rival tribe is headed our way. This is recognition of a threat to our people, but also a diagnosis. We have the cure, in the form of the hero, and again, they will bring in the new age. See how this all keeps coming back to this? The trickster is our comic relief. The gravity of our stories can sometimes be suffocating, filled with dread and fear, negative emotions that can cast a pall over the story. If you remember our lesson on audience attention span, you'll remember it moves in waves. Our ancient ancestors understood this too, even if only unconsciously, and so we have the trickster. They both lighten the mood and bring new or different emotions to prevent the tale from being monotone. But DC, surely that can't be all there is to it though. Well, guy who talks to your monitor, you're absolutely right. Tricksters serve a much higher purpose. Tricksters are out-of-the-box thinkers, often bringing in a perspective, a worldview, or a persona that differs quite a bit from our hero, but not so much that they can't be allies. Again, talking about playing with archetypes, in The Singer and the Charlatan, the character of Trixie is both a trickster and one of the two heroes. Her perspective on the world varies so wildly from not just the hero, but the world itself, that she's comical while having a very specific ideology. As a priestess of the god of trickery, she believes that every trick and prank she pulls reveals a greater truth to the victim. That is the greatest gift she can give, because she believes her god is not one of trickery, but of truth. Like letting a child do something stupid to gain the knowledge not to do it again. Trixie believes that her pranks are life lessons to the glory of her god. She's enlightened her victims in playing pranks on them, spreads her god's message through the land. These unique perspectives from the trickster character are often humorous, but, like Trixie, often enlightening us to a side of the story you wouldn't otherwise get. 
because of this wonderful and unique purpose that they serve in stories, I get super frustrated when weak Hollywood writing often makes these trickster characters cowards, like we see with films like Judge Dredd or Central Intelligence. The heart of the trickster is strong, and they often have their own reasons for crossing paths with the hero. Having them run away at the first sign of danger, or being comic relief by falling into a dumpster, is quite honestly disrespectful to the archetype. But hey, cheap laughs, am I right? The point is, we understand that the trickster is a valuable messenger of a different way of thinking in the world you've built. Lean on this to inform us and deepen our understanding of your world. Ooh, this is a fun one, you guys. I mean, really, really fun. The shapeshifter is the character archetype that moves between good and evil, often with a double cross. There are millions of variations on this archetype, from the beautiful damsel turned spy to the scarred, beaten creature whose mind has been split in two. What they bring to our story is a multitude of options for storytelling. They can be a love interest, a fake ally, or an enemy that sees the good that the hero represents and wants to join. The shapeshifter's purpose in storytelling is equally multifaceted. They can be used as a storytelling device to show the allure of the dark side and why the shapeshifter is choosing it over the light. They can be used to show the evil and corruption that the darkness represents, basically a dark version of the Herald. But the most important thing that they do is the relationship dynamic that they create when they're woven into the hero's life. Whether an ally or a love interest, they get under the hero's skin somehow. They're allowed in. If they're double-crossing our hero, then the hero believes them part of the light and has allowed them past their defenses. If they were a rival that joins our hero, then the opposite is true. They were kept at an arm's length as an enemy until they saw the light. This light and shadow dynamic plays out in all of our archetypes quite heavily because it's not just the battle of our tribes protecting ourselves from threats outside the community fire pit, but also the war waging inside of each of us. The shapeshifter is conflicted. They walk between the light and the dark before they commit to a side. If they're a traitor, then the darkness consumes them. If they're an ally, then the light burns away their misdeeds. This is one of the most unique, varied, and interesting archetypes to play with, and I highly recommend using them to their fullest extent. This is another opportunity to stretch your legs and experiment. The Guardian is, quite simply, the character or obstacle that stands in the way of the hero's journey. Often, this can be the big bad's lieutenant, but it could also be as simple as the doors that speak only truth and lies and labyrinth. Their function is clear. They're there to tell the hero to go home, because they're not good enough in some way. This is the voice of doubt, and it often manifests in the form of the hero's weakness. So if the hero is a, a man with a soft spot for women, the guardian may be a female that forces him into a kill-or-be-killed battle against her. If the hero is always restraining themselves, the guardian forces them to release their full power. If the shadow is of frightening intelligence and cunning, many of our old tales had a guardian that presented the hero with riddles. By the hero solving the riddle, they both best the guardian and prove that they're ready for the final confrontation. It is worth noting that many guardians are often the one that dog the hero the most. For example, in the larger scope of the original um, Star Wars prequel trilogy, Darth Maul is a guardian. Palpatine is the real enemy, but Darth Maul stalks our heroes throughout the story, constantly a threat, and always reminding them that they're not ready for the power that stands behind them. Now that we mention that power, of course, it's the Shadow. The Shadow is the antagonist, the villain, the darkness, whatever you want to call them. As with every archetype on this list, probably with the sole exception of the hero, this archetype does not necessarily need to be a person. Whatever it is, be it Darth Vader or giant space rocks, it casts a shadow over the hero's world, and the only through the hero's journey can the darkness be vanquished. Once again, we're looking at our ancient ancestors for guidance, and the answers come in droves. Volcanic eruptions, plagues, gods on tall mountains. 
the dragon terrorizing the land, the witch poisoning the harvest. All that is wrong and dark is, is the shadow. But look deeper. Often, the best antagonist is a mirror for our protagonist. Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, Neo and Smith, Frodo and Gollum, they show us that the hero has the villain inside them, but light overcomes the shadow. This is an internal morality play, the battle that rages inside of all of us to not allow the darkness to swallow us like it swallowed the antagonist. So again, we're talking about threats within and threats without. The shadow is always too late. They realize their folly most often in death. Any redemption they may seek comes at the price of their life, a justice for the crimes they've committed. Like with Darth Vader, his last moments spent seeking redemption means we will sing his songs as a cautionary tale. Because if we, if he hadn't recanted, his name would be so vile it won't be spoken in good company. Look at the final scene here. He says he wants his helmet off to look at his son with his own eyes. He is literally removing the black helmet with black lenses to gaze upon the light for the first time since his fall. Do you see how much deeper meaning is going on and why the story endures while others not not so much? Now, now that we've gotten to this point, I think you can see why I've been driving home the stories of our ancestors here. You, sitting there watching this right now, come from a proud line of storytellers. You are carrying on a tradition that predates the written word. The tales that you tell aren't just to amuse. These are stories that endure and also speak to something that resonates within all of us. Whether it's the struggle of a new threat on our horizon or the battle that all of us must face within, when that time comes, we recite these stories and find our inner Luke or King Arthur or Gilgamesh or Neo. It's a pretty cool way of looking at our scribbly dibblies, isn't it? Classic archetypes tell the most legendary tales of this era or any era, and time proves that. The stories we share today follow the same beats and archetypes that were present before writing stuff down was a thing. We all need a dose of that reality every now and again to remind us who we are and what our stories represent. I hope it informs your love of writing that much more. So, Happy New Year, everybody! I took a week off uh, for Christmas and spent time with my little girl. We'll be talking a little bit more about her next week. In the meantime, sign up for my newsletter. The link is in the comments below, and you're going to get Cora Blake, Arcane Agent, totally free. The latest newsletter just went out today, and it was loaded with cool authors and promotions, plus a look at the future of the Dragon's Dream Saga. So stay in the loop and sign up. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe to hear about new videos. As always, I'm DC Ferguson. Now have fun and get crafting.